Um, like I try and win the most over like the course of a format instead of like like sometimes I'll have ideas um, and then just not even play them at a tournament because I'll uh, I know that I can play it later in a format. Um, so that I can like try and see success at multiple events in a single format. Well, that I mean, would never have been something I would have done when I started traveling. I mean, we we've seen some famous quotes from you. Um, you know, like at the beginning of Atlanta, you said you were gonna pull out all the stops that you had uh, with uh, that mentality, um, and it really didn't seem like it was that successful for you. Could that have been, you know, just the format? Um, I mean, like obviously it. it it can't always work. Like I, I, I kind of think that you have to believe that you're gonna win. Like I think that has a lot to do with actually winning. Um, and while it's like pretty much delusional to think you're gonna win every tournament, if you want to act like actually do well, then you have to actually convince yourself of that, even if it's not true. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I try and always convince myself of it. It's definitely not a bad mindset to have, especially going into competitive play that, you know, like, you you own this, this is your tournament, and stuff like that. I mean, has there ever been a time where that mentality has backfired on you? Um, what do you mean backfired? Just, like... Uh, just, col I want to say, like, collapsing on yourself, put yourself on tilt. Um, no, I don't know. I don't, I don't really get put on tilt much anymore, but, um, there are definitely plenty of times where it just doesn't work, like... Or you convince yourself it's going to work, and like I mean, obviously you can't win every tournament, um, but yeah, sometimes it just doesn't work. <laughs> well, fair enough. Fair I, don't enough. Think I, I don't think it ever like works the other way, like works against me or anything. No, you said you really don't go on tilt much anymore. Uh, is that just with experience and time now? Yeah, I definitely think it has a lot to do with experience. Like I mean, if you're sitting across from. Uh, somebody you can just like no matter who it is just be like I know I played more than you I know I practiced more than you it's really just like kind of comforting um, and it's hard to get put on tilt once you like put it into perspective like that huh. fair enough well Hoban I guess the, the the next question we're going to ask you is uh, give us a little bit of a rundown on yourself uh, what credentials do you have in the game uh, uh, what have you done all right, so I have 30 tops. Um, I've won eight tournaments. I won nationals in 2013. I've won two YCSs, and I've won five circuits. Um, well, obviously, what was your most glorious event? Um, I mean, I feel like the first top is always kind of like the – or the first win is always kind of like the most special like you definitely just like feel less excited with each one um after that like so like getting there finally after um because so like i had actually spent like two years basically bubbling almost every event that i went to before i ever started doing well um and when i won nationals it was just kind of like right after that so it, it definitely felt like really good to go from almost getting there every single time to finally like going all the way. <laughs> you kind of had the old uh, Van Sant bubbling thing going on back in the day, the way it sounds. Yeah. <laughs> I could uh, probably lap him in bubbles. I got, I got tons of bubbles. <laughs> oh, man. Um, all right. So... I know you really enjoyed the online community, and uh, some people even say you're a character online. Oh, why? 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 Why do you? Okay, what? What is the difference of you versus real life as opposed to online? Um, well, I don't know. Like, so I definitely really like talking shit. Am I allowed to say that? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're, you're good. You're fine. Oh, cool. All right, so yeah, 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 like I definitely like doing that. This is like one of my favorite pastimes, but like, I mean, I don't know. This is something to do, right? <laughs> well, I've noticed lately, like overall, I would say within the past three months, your your demeanor overall has been like a lot more positive, like almost everything completely upbeat. Like, uh, what's kind of shaped that? I don't know. What, what is there to be mad at, I guess? <laughs> I mean, do you consider everything to be going good in the game at the moment? Um, yeah, I mean, like, I think that, like, are you talking about, like, 
format specific or what? Um, we can go both ways, both both format and uh, cards in general. I don't necessarily think that there are very many skillful formats. I think it's almost every format starts out skillful, um, and that they can become solved where you just can't keep going up. And then no matter how skillful of a format it was, like after enough time has passed and the format gets solved, then the format stops being skillful. Um, so like I, I really just like when things change uh, so that it never gets stale. Well, uh, something that uh, a friend of mine quoted was uh, he believed the Atlanta format wasn't solved to the potential that it was. Um, much in the same way that you broke the format with Vanity's Fiend quite some time ago, or not Vanity's Fiend, Vanity's Emptiness quite some yeah. time ago. Do you believe that to be true? Um, I don't really know. Like, I, I thought I had it, and apparently I did not. So, um, I don't know. Because, like, so at Atlanta, I played Mass Change second um, in the, um, just in the Pepe deck. And... Dark Law was like really, really good because it was really easy to go Dark Law rank four. So if you could go Dark Dark Law Reflasia, then Dark Law would hit like one card out of their hand. Um, then they would have to use two scales, um, and then Reflasia could hit two more cards. And so then they'd only have like one card. So every time you could go like Dark Law Reflasia, it was kind of an auto win. Um, plus, you could also do stuff like Nightmare was really common um, in Atlanta. So you could do stuff like uh, make Nightmare miss timing. Where you just like, uh, let's say you had Armageddon on the field or something, you just like activate a scale, you chain mass change, and you summon out um, Dark Law, then they couldn't Nightmare there since it was in the middle of the chain resolving. Um, so I don't know, I thought I had a really big advantage, I guess I just didn't though. <laughs> you just believe that because it was just the, how crazy the format actually was? Yeah, I mean, like the format was definitely insane. Um, I think that. I think one of the things that we did wrong, because we started uh, looking at it after, and we're like, all right, so why didn't we do well? Because we definitely thought we were going to. Um, and I think it was that we didn't play very many bomb cards. Like, you definitely need some amount of cards that are just, like, blowouts. Um, and usually it's, like, two to three. And when we were, like, doing our ratios and stuff, we kind of wavering eyes as a bomb card. Really, wavering eyes is more of a starter card. Um, so I think we just kind of misassigned it, and then we just didn't have any like super powerful like one card in the game type cards like you know Regeki or something like that. Um, and other people in the tournament did have cards like those, so I think that was probably where we went wrong. All right, um, would you say that actually playing the game or talking theory and discussion would put a player further within the game? Um, I definitely think they're both necessary. Like, I don't think you can get um, super far on theory alone, but I would probably weigh theory more. Um, but you definitely need playtesting to be able to see things that you wouldn't catch just by, uh, just off of theory. Like, I think theory is probably more important, but all theory is probably based on playtesting. Yeah. So, uh, when when getting like a theory group, like getting a, a group together, because it's really hard to bounce ideas off yourself in the game, what do you look for in that kind of a group? Um, well, lately I've been uh, just bouncing ideas off of my friend Abe. Um, like, uh, he's my fraternity brother, he just started getting back in the game. He's been playing since like the summer now. Um, and he's been, uh, I don't know, really good to theory with. So what do you kind of, like, obviously you've known him for some time, right? Yep. Like, what do you, you know, when you when you look at, like, because a lot of people you know are in areas where it's hard to, like, have other people around. Like, you know, you sell when you sell cards, like, you see that a lot of them are shipped out to random places in Michigan or wherever where, you, you know, you don't have people to listen to. And a lot of the people on Twitch are here because they might not have other places to go. Like, when, when looking for maybe, like, people to talk to, what would you suggest? Um, I think the biggest thing is they have to want the same things as you do. Like, if you want to, like, you know, go to every event and, like, do well as at as many events as possible, 
then you can't like talk theory with someone who uh, doesn't ever go to events because they just won't have like the same motivations as you. But I mean, that's kind of why like online is such a big resource. Um, just because like I know for myself, like I I lived in one of those areas where I didn't have anybody uh, to talk theory with as a kid. Um, and I used like Duelist Grounds, Yu-Gi-Oh! ETC, all those kind of places just to like try and talk uh, theory with as many people as I could with similar motivations. Um, no. So you, you were talking about how your friends is now getting back into the game. Do you, do you feel that there's always that one friend that you're always going to be closer to than your playtesting group that really doesn't travel to events that you, you want to, you want them to have the same drive as you? But sometimes it just doesn't work out. Kind of like your working project kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, definitely. Um, like, I really think the similar motivations are probably <laughs> the biggest thing to look for. Because, I mean, you can teach anyone to be good at Yu-Gi-Oh! But if they don't, like, want to be good at Yu-Gi-Oh! Then, like, they're never going to be. So, like, wanting to be is probably the first step um, in trying to find someone that you want to uh, playtest with or theory with. I, I mean, I, I agree with you. One one of the biggest challenges that I have is I have a friend that he he literally lives like a mile and a half from me. Like, you know, you're, there's obviously the momentum of you're good at Yu-Gi-Oh! And then you have that friend that you consider super close that just plays Black Wings. Yep. <laughs> and you're just like, why do you do this? Like, you want them to be as good as you, but sometimes, like you said, that drive just isn't there for them. Yeah, definitely. Um, I, I've definitely had that experience as well. But, I mean, I guess that's why you just want to, like, have as big of a circle as you can so that you can, you know, find the people who do have similar motivations. Because it's really hard to convince someone to, you know, want to be good or whatever. But you can teach someone who does want to be good how to actually be good. Um, what, what do you, okay, what, what's your rigorous training to, you know, get one of your friends good at the game? Um, I mean, we just play test for like hours on end, basically. Um, we play test with like our hands face up. We just uh, acting as if like we don't know what our opponents have, um, and we just sit there and grind it out for hours, I guess. Huh? So you, you're basically doing the the whole Billy Break thing, just play testing until four a.m. until you're uh, ready to collapse and pass out. Yeah, four a.m. like the next day, we go like thirty six hours at a time. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> Man, <laughs> oh, um, we play a lot. <laughs> Now, do you, when you're playtesting with your hand face up, is there ever just that time to where you're like, you know what I got, and I know you're making this play, but are you just doing it with the assumption that they can make the correct play? Well, um, that's kind of like part of the reason that you do it is because, like, um, obviously we're trying to playtest, like, we don't know what they have, and, like, uh, just trying to make the right play as if they were playing with their hands uh, not revealed, but um, with both players playing with both their hands revealed, it's like two people to catch uh, like the other person being biased and be like, all right, no, you know you wouldn't do this. And then you can just like talk about it and catch it and then, you know, not make that play if it's, if that is what it is. So, I mean, I, I assume you guys re reverse play at times and talk about other possible plays and scenarios and stuff like that, right? Yeah, definitely. We go back all the time. Uh, someone in asked an interesting question. How does Mind Crush uh, work in that scenario? Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Because um, usually, we, I mean, we just test against, like, the standards. Uh, like, whatever decks are standard. Mind Crush hasn't been standard in a deck in a long time. Long before I was good. Um, no, back in the day, uh, we always used to credit Lazaro Bolito with having some amazing foresight ability reading two or three turns in advance. Um, do you still believe players to have that ability in the current TCG? Well, I mean, yeah, definitely. You can see how the games are kind of going to shape up. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, okay, Hoban, how, how far do you consider yourself able to read a game state, depending on the situation? I mean, obviously, you can see where the game's going, but there's also the, you know, which, which path is this going to go? Right. Um... I don't know that it's necessarily like this is how it's going to go for sure kind of thing. I think it's more of like a range of options where it's just like, you know, if you have a set card, if it's Solemn Strike, it's going to go this way. If it's not Solemn Strike, it's going to go this way. And then like you can know the chances that it is Solemn Strike 
um, and then you know the chances that it's not solemn strike or something. So then I don't know that it's necessarily like a good thing to say that you ever have like a a read on something. It's more of like a range of like probabilities of in, like where it'll go in anticipation. Yeah. <sighs> I, I, I want to sit here and just poke your brain for theory of this entire time, honestly, because it, 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 it's it's cool to, you know, get the chance to sit here and see your mindset and things and, you know, how things turn in your head, you know, and especially the way you value things. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, we were talking about before the stream here, um, you really enjoy the pendulum mechanic, correct? Yeah, I like it a lot. Um, and you were talking about Solemn Strike being an issue for that. Um yep. What what do you want to see change to make pendulums better, assuming that Solemn Strike gets limited to one? Um Well, I don't know that I really care about like the pendulum mechanic in particular getting better. I think I just care about like something changing. Because like I said, I, I think that every format gets solved after a certain point. And I think if we're not there yet, we're pretty close to it um, right now. And I'm, I would just like to see something change so that there's like a new format to solve. You you say that, but Calvin Tahan did a really good job last weekend at the ARG. Yeah, he did. Yep, he did. Calvin was also one of the first people people to read my book. I I know. We'll we'll get, we'll get to that in a bit. Don't worry. Don't worry. <laughs> yeah yeah. Um, I mean like Calvin, uh, he definitely did do a really good job. Um, no one was trying to beat the uh, whatever that monster is called, but was it the fact that they weren't trying to beat her? They were just not prepared for it. Well, um, so I think what Calvin did is like he looked at the meta and was just like, "What are people not trying to beat?" And if you look at all the decks, like they just don't have outs for it or whatever. Like people aren't playing like the kaiju's or whatever. Um, then. Uh, Cosmos don't really have an out at all. You could just spin the one Utopia Lightning. Um, so basically people weren't, they just didn't have an out in, in his deck, so he built his deck to just like do the same thing every game and then just get to that monster as quickly as he could because he knew people just wouldn't have an out. Fair enough, fair enough. Um, when going into an ARG, uh, how much time yourself? Well, I, I scratch that question. What do you do before an event? Oh, to you know, prep yourself. How much sleep do you get? Things uh, like that. I, I don't sleep very much at all, except for the weekends of events. Like at at events is probably like when I get the most sleep. Probably like you know seven or eight hours the uh, night of an event, of an event, but. The weeks leading up to it, <laughs> not nearly as much. So you you really do do that that whole twenty hour playtesting thing a day? Yeah, we don't. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I feel like if I sleep, I'm missing out on things. Uh, but sometimes you know you need sleep to get your brain recuperated. Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, I. <laughs> All right. So a, a side question, something that I need to ask uh, for the cube master. Uh, do you actually enjoy playing cube, uh, especially Delhans? For cube, uh, I don't know. I kind of get bored during cube, actually. Um, really? Yeah, just because it's like, especially with the tag team duels, it's like when I pass my turn, it's probably ten minutes until I start my next turn, just because there are three other people playing, and like I don't know, that's a lot of time to just not be doing much. So I assume I, that you weren't an avid fan of Battle Pack sealed then, were you? for top cut um no I, I actually did like sealed a lot like i didn't think i would like sealed but then um once they started doing it it just became evident that like nobody would practice and then like if you had just practiced then you would obviously do really well um so i i like that it rewarded people who practiced did you actually take time to practice though yeah how, how much did you practice sealed um Probably like six or seven drafts. Like we didn't do it a ton, but we did it enough to um, have an advantage over the like everybody who didn't. 
like because there were a lot of things that weren't inherently obvious and um you know once you do it a little bit then they become obvious um one of our viewers wants to know what's your current uh favorite deck of the format uh i mean probably pendulums i like the pendulums a lot but why god i don't know that like i like cards that basically just give extra cards to yourself like i don't really care about uh cards that stop my opponent um I'd rather just let them do whatever they want to do and then let me do whatever I want to do and then have the deck that does more be the best deck, like be the deck that wins. I'm not trying to play reactively. Like, I feel like Cosmo's really reactive. Um, I'm not trying to like summon a monster to, uh, that stops my opponent or flip a trap that stops my opponent. I just want to like make a big field and have my opponent make a big field and my field be bigger. I feel like films probably do that the best. You definitely would not have liked gadgets then. <laughs> I actually got my first regional top of gadgets. Really? I didn't know that. Yeah. 2007. Hey, that's the same year I got my first one too. Nice. But we do have something in common after all. Yeah. Hoban, we need to sit down and make gadgets good this format. I don't know how. Um, oh man, we actually tried gadgets in an Ignite deck. We were playing, uh... <laughs> what? Yeah. Oh man. Look, I keep trying to make Ignites work. I'm gonna make this deck work if it's the last thing I do. Um, we played, uh, car curries in it, <laughs> and then we would summon, like, a gadget, and then, or we would, like, summon one gadget, and then... Or pendulum summon one gadget or whatever, and then like destroy the ignites after we have pendulum summon whatever, and then go get Rose Warrior and then normal summon it and then make the like car curry burrito, and then um, summon another or summon another thing off of the burrito and then be able to make more synchros. I don't know, it's cool. So ignite or ignites are literally your 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 project deck, the thing that you enjoy kind of tinkering with, right? Yeah, I waste like hella time on them. Like, for them to always suck, but uh, well, I, mean, I keep trying. <laughs> every Yu-Gi-Oh player has their guilty obsession. You know, John won't let the Samurai die. Oh, yeah. I let that die a while ago, actually. <laughs> Man, you were playing Xi'an in uh, Pepe. I don't want to hear it from you. Hey, we were talking about that card yesterday. We were like, whoa, that card's a three. Well, that's because of Ignites. I played it in Ignite Pepe when it was Magicians. And Come it was on, that's me. It was a walking floodgate, so like you could actually use. Uh, Wally actually taught me this. Use two of the level five ignites, uh, pop them both, get a she and make a scale, and then you uh, pendulum summon out your two level fives and she and and you have she and Yeah. All right. So, Hoban, who, who are your favorite players in the game? Who do you look to? My favorite players. Um, I think probably my favorite player is Barrett. Um, Barrett just loves the game more than anybody I've ever met. And, I don't know, I just really like that. Really? So you, you look to his passion and stuff? Yeah, definitely. That, that's definitely interesting. I, I assume you do a lot of discussion with Barrett in terms of uh, the passion side of the game and things like that. Yeah, we talk some. Oh, fair enough, fair enough. All right, Hoban. Let's let's get to the hard hitting thing of the t uh, the night. Let's talk right. about your book. All right, cool. Okay, well, first off, give us the rundown of this, and don't leave any detail unturned. All right, the rundown. So, it's broken down into a few different sections. Um, I think there are like four main sections. Uh, the first section is basically just like how to be rational, I guess. Um, and then it's like a lot about like what keeps you from being rational um, and then like different ways to think about things better. Um, talk about motivation a lot. Um, I think goals are really bad for motivation. Um, and then the second one, uh, sorry, I guess they're probably uh, five sections. The second section is um, just like your circle or your team or whatever. Um, just like how to go about playtesting, like who you should uh, pick on your team. Um, like the uh, basically the playtesting process of like how you do your hands face up, how to get the most out of your time. Like for instance, if you're trying to um, test a certain thing, like um, you're trying to figure out how good, I don't know, 
emergency teleport is. Well, there's no need to wait to draw a teleport in your opening hand. You can just put it in your opening hand and then have four random cards there. Or if you're trying to see what it's like two turns in, then you can just make it your draw two turns in, and then you can like really focus your testing um, by like not having to wait to see, wait for it to come up, and then have all this like irrelevant information in between when it doesn't come up. Um, so then I talk a lot about that and just how to get the most out of the time that you put in. Um, and the next section is just like technical play. Um, like your role in the game, resources and stuff. Um, then uh, the next section is like the mental game, which is just like, uh, you know, getting a read on your opponent or talking your opponent into things. Like sometimes you just got to tell them that you want to win more than they want to win. You just got to <laughs> let them know. Um, and then... The next section is deck building. This is probably the biggest section of the book by far. Um, I condensed like a lot of the things in the deck building into like specific rules. Um, I think there's something like 120 rules and of like what's better than uh, something else. Like for instance, um, one deck building rule is it's better to give yourself an extra card than take away an extra card from your opponent. So I'd rather, you know, play Pot of Greed than Delinquent Duo for the most part. Um, and you want to build your deck that way. So it's got a whole bunch of different rules. Um, there's actually, like, a, a ratio that I used on, like, every single deck I've ever won with. Um, and this was something I didn't even know I did. I, I, I like, realized it after the fact. Um, and it's not like monsters, magic traps. It's like starter cards, bombs, like that. And I, I had like the same ratio across like every different deck I've ever used uh, and done well with. Um, and it talks about like that ratio and like why certain things work the way they do. Um, and then also in the deck building section, I talk about side decking. I don't even put that in the like technical play because like. Side decking isn't really something, it's not really a decision you should make during the game. It's something you should like have a plan for before you come in because um, you don't really want to change your ratios. Like, you don't want to, you know, take out like a starter card and then put in another defensive card because then you'll just draw a bunch of defensive cards. And then, like, sure, you may not lose, but you're not winning if you only had a bunch of defensive cards. Um, so then. That, that's the last thing. Oh, and I talk about probability in the deck building section. Um, then I talk about uh, metagames in the final section. And um, just like how to identify the trends in the game because uh, like sometimes if a deck tops, it's not necessarily going to become the new standard or whatever. Um, so you, you kind of have to learn to identify what will become standard and what won't become standard. Um, to get the most out of your playtesting, because like I don't want to build a deck and then play against my friend's deck. I want to build a deck and then play against you know what I'm actually going to be playing against at the tournament. Um, so talk about a, a lot of how to identify that, how to identify when stuff changes, like um, what counts for more. Like for instance, you know the winning deck list counts for more than another deck that just topped or something. Um, so it'll have more of an influence on the standard. Um, then talk about how to like uh, plan to do well across a whole format, um, like saving ideas or omitting events or a bunch of stuff like that. And that is basically the book. So uh, I took a few notes here and uh, would love to ask you some questions on that. Okay, so let's go back to deck building rules. Uh, you said there's almost 120 rules. How many of those are for the side deck? For the side deck, um, probably not that many. Um, probably because the deck building rules were only um, in reference to like construction, so a lot of it was um, not how to the, like the deck building rules aren't like how you would change uh, your deck in between games. It would just be like how to uh, build your side deck. Which would mostly be like, you don't want to, for instance, play a card like, uh, 
what's a good example? You you don't want to play a card like Imperial Iron Wall to beat Cosmo or something. If your deck just has a higher ceiling than Cosmo, you want to play cards like MST against Cosmo because if I can play a you can play, then I'm gonna win out. So like I don't need to stop your deck. So I just want to make sure to have cards like that will let me play. Okay. Um, so with uh, a card, a card you're well known for, Upstart Goblin, uh, typically cuts your deck down to 37 cards so you can get to your core strategy faster. Uh, when you side deck versus a strategy uh, that requires you to side more cards than normal one of the format, uh, do those typically go out? Not usually. Uh, usually the only time I side with Upstart is one at a time. Um, so it's weird. I actually don't think that like 37 is necessarily like an ideal number, <laughs> as strange as that may come across to people. Um, I think that every deck has an ideal deck count, and that like 40 is a pretty random number. Like that's just like where they say the minimum has to be or something, right? But it's not like a number that actually means anything. And I think that the right number of cards like changes. Um, from deck to deck, like for instance, if you had an Infernity deck, you wouldn't would just want the minimum number of cards. Like you couldn't do anything with a ten card Infernity deck. You you would need a certain amount of cards to search. But like, there's also an ideal number where you could probably like get to your combo pretty much every game and then have it do enough to not just you know suck. Like if I had a ten card combo or a ten card deck or whatever, and I make an Infernity combo, sure I could search like two cards, but then you know. That's about it. It doesn't do anything. So you would need a higher deck count. Um, and I think that the deck count is usually a lot lower than 40. Like, it's probably closer to 30 or 32 or something. Um, and that 37 is probably just the closest you can get to it. Uh, now in your book, uh, do you make a reference to uh, the appropriateness of siding something like Imperial uh, Wall if you're playing against something that's more devastating in, like, a Tier 0 format, per se? Um, yeah, well, one of the things I talk about is uh, you don't really want to um, beat the best deck. Like, you do just kind of want to be playing whatever the most powerful deck is, whatever the deck, whatever deck does the most. Um, and then when you're playing against other decks, that, like, for instance, if it was, like, you know, Pepe versus Pepe, you might want to side, like, the Imperial Iron Wall of that matchup, like, I don't know, like, Anti-Spell or something, like where I could stop my opponent. Um, but in other matchups, you just want to be basically siding cards that let you play. Because then if you can play and your deck can do more, then your deck will beat their deck anyway. It, it's kind of like Teledad back in the day, meaning oppression. It's just if you flip it, it's a Wintcon, right? Yeah, definitely. I, I think even uh, Monarchs now are main... Or, they're citing Mask of Restrict for that very reason. I mean, if you draw in with an established board, you just win, right? Yeah, definitely. Uh, um, now, do you consider that to be something common that comes as the formats progress? Floodgates? Yeah, definitely. Because, um, I mean, Floodgates target, like, a really narrow aspect, but then they completely shut it off. Like, you know, Mask of Restrict with Tribute Summoning or whatever. So, like, if the format became an all-tribute summon format, then, yeah, you could play a card like Mask of Restrict. Um... And then just completely cut that aspect off, but it wouldn't. That wouldn't be as good earlier in the format where you know some may some decks may tribute summon and some decks may not. Then you're gonna ha if you main deck it, you would have to like draw it against the decks that don't. But as the format progressed, if it was an old tribute summon format or something, then uh, main decking it would become much better since that would be all you were playing against. Now, in your book, do you make references to floodgates? Yeah, definitely. Um, uh, I mean, like, I think that floodgates are definitely an important part. Um, like, I don't think that if you're expecting to grind out every single game, like, that's not a reliable tournament strategy. Like, you're gonna get tired. You're gonna you're gonna not play perfectly all day, and those are like real constraints that you just kind of have to acknowledge. Um, and I feel like you need some amount of games where you're just like, I flip this, and I win because I flip it, and you don't have the out. Um, I don't know. Like, I guess that sounds ignorant, but, like, it acknowledges the fact that you're just going to get tired as the day goes on. And uh, 
I, I I think you basically need auto wins to ever have a realistic chance of winning a tournament. So do you feel that having weird techie cards in your deck can get you there? Yeah, I mean, definitely. Um, I think that every single tournament I've ever won it, then um, I have had some kind of major deck advantage. Um, whether it was a tech or just like a stronger engine than the other people were playing. But, like, for instance, the last tournament I won was uh, Vegas, and there I was playing um, All Maru, and, like, everybody wanted to go second in the mirror matches. I think I played, like, ten mirror matches or something there, and everybody wanted to go second, and they didn't have a really good going first plan. Um, and, like, so when I went first, I could just make Naturi Beast. Um, and then that was just, like, a really, really big advantage over everybody else who just wanted to go second and didn't have a really good strategy for going first. All right, so I have a question. Obviously, being in the game as long as you have, you've had to deal with people like cheating, using tactics in Yu-Gi-Oh! where it gives an unfair advantage, like trying to make you draw certain cards, trying to draw cards themselves. Do you address in your book how to deal with cheaters in the game? Uh, you know, I, I, I don't know. I didn't really think about it very much in the book, but... It is definitely something you have to deal with and watch out for. So, uh, have you had any personal experiences like with people trying to cheat you as you've been going through as many tournaments as you've had, and how did you deal with that? Yeah, um, well, all right, so this was last weekend, actually, um, in Virginia. Uh, I played against this guy who has been banned for cheating, and... Um, like he tried like three different things during the match um and it was just like you know he summoned a card trooper i flipped a warning on it and he tried to draw i'm like no you don't draw um and then it was a bunch of different things and then on the last one i didn't catch it and he got away with it and he ended up winning the match because of it and like i would have finished first after swiss but then like if that didn't happen and it was an illegal play but yeah it definitely happens so, uh, if you had any advice to give, uh, besides watch really closely uh, at all opponents, like, what would you say to somebody, like, trying to deal, with, like, that has to deal with that at their locals or regional events and, uh, you know, bigger events as well? How, what would you, t like, advice would you give them? To well, not I, th I think the biggest thing is you would definitely have to call people out on it. Like, you can't just, like, let it go unsaid. Or, like, um, like if I ever think someone's looking at my deck, then I'll just, like, pick up my deck, reshuffle it, and then just, like, don't look down again, and then just call them out on it and put them on the spot, and then, like, I don't know. Um, but you definitely can't let it go unsaid or, like, think that it's okay to just, like, you know, even just take a, taking a final cut or tell them to not look down anymore, because then it's too late if, like, you don't just like completely re-randomize it yourself at that point yeah so what inspired you to write a book um uh so uh i really wanted to like teach ben uh ever like everything i knew about the game but like sometimes it was just like hard to put into words like certain concepts or um ideas and I, I basically just wanted to write it so that i could explain it all in like a well thought out manner was there any inspiration i uh, just to teach bit everything i knew about it now, uh, who who all has had the chance to look at your book so far? I know uh, you mentioned Calvin was your editor. Yeah, he was one of them. Um, I, there are a few people editing it. My friend Saul, um, then uh, Johnny Lee, um, Fraser read it, uh, Chris has read it, um, Abe's reading it. I think that's about it. It's probably only about six or seven people that have read it so far. Well, I, I pre-ordered a copy of your book for Detroit. Oh, cool. are, you, are you going to be uh, signing them? Yeah, definitely. I'm looking forward to that. How many of them have sold so far? Uh, about 125. That's actually really good. Are you planning on releasing it digitally? Uh, not at this time. It's not that I'm necessarily opposed to it. It's that like, the royalties on it are just like so much lower. Um, 
that it just doesn't really make sense to. I got you. This also isn't your first book, is it? Uh, no, I, I wrote um, like a shorter book um, before. It was called Donald Trump, Art of the Quack, and it was just basically about how like I don't think he was running for president uh, to actually try and win. I think he's basically doing it to uh, promote the name around or like the brand around his name. Because like if you ever see like Trump Towers or something or Trump on the side of any building, it doesn't actually mean that he owns the building. Um, it, it means that like people had to like paid him to put their name there or to put his name there because they wanted like their building to be associated with like the connotation of Trump, like the lifestyle that comes with it. So like the more people that like him or the more advertising he gets by running for president, the more valuable that name is. I got you. Do you believe that there's anything in Yu-Gi-Oh that equivalates to that though? Do I think what? Just seeing more things everywhere just kind of helps reinforce certain messages in the game and things like that um yeah i mean like i don't know that it necessarily translates to helping you win more tournaments but uh yeah i mean if you see something more often you'll definitely remember it more all right i'm i'm gonna get into some of the, the meatier questions here now that we've got the chance to talk about your book and also uh, guys watching and joining us, uh, if you guys are interested in the book, it's available on ARG site right now, correct, Pat? Yep. Yeah, it is. Um, can you uh, send me the link to that so I can link it on the stream? Yeah, sure. That way they can check it out and get the chance to pick up their copy if they're interested. I know, I know a lot of people had uh, said that it was kind of expensive to have it shipped outside of the U.S., um, but if you live outside of the U.S., you could probably order it on Amazon when it comes out, and the shipping will probably be a lot cheaper. Fair enough, fair enough. Uh, all right, I sent you the link. Uh, for those of you uh, that are just joining us, like I said, uh, so we've been joined here with our good friend Patrick Hoban, uh, getting a chance to talk about his book and everything. Uh, and we're going to get into some of the, the more hard-hitting questions here, as I said in a sec. All right, there you go. Pat, I shared it, and it's good to go. Much appreciated. Um, it's also uh, cheaper right now than it will be once it's released. Um, it's like, it's $20 now, and then if you wait until it's actually released uh, next weekend, it goes up to 25 then, so definitely more of an advantage to get it now. Fair enough. Uh, I mean, I definitely recommend it. Um, I, I've i been taking a look at uh, Patrick Chaplin's book for Magic, <laughs> uh, yep. Next Level Magic. Uh, obviously, I'm looking forward to your book and getting the chance to actually see where you're coming from on some of your opinions and stuff like that. You know, that was actually something um, that I guess I could talk about is, so in uh, Next Level Magic, he talks about the theory of everything, um, which has kind of been like the guiding framework for like most of card theory. Uh, whether it was Magic or Yu-Gi-Oh, just basically how like all um, all things are tied to resources within the game, and actually kind of uh, dispute his theory of everything in my book, um, talking about how like all right, well, first of all, if you're gonna have a theory of everything, I don't think it can leave things out. <laughs> like, doesn't that seem a little contradictory or whatever? Well, I mean, it, it's it's the same way of playing every card game. Every card game can teach you something bringing it to Yu-Gi-Oh. I mean, hell, Yu-Gi-Oh teaches you how to be conservative, but when you play Pokemon, you can just literally blow your load playing the game because there's no limit to how many cards you can draw. But Yu-Gi-Oh teaches you, you know, obviously resource management. Probably better than some games. Pro yeah, I mean, like, I think that a lot of it translates to a whole lot of different areas. Like, uh... I definitely read Next Level Magic, and that was like a good starting point um, for trying to get better at Yu-Gi-Oh. But uh, since then, I've kind of like started reading more uh, business books to try and like get better at Yu-Gi-Oh. Um, and like, I don't, I don't care anything about business, but um, a lot of the concepts just translate really well um, to Yu-Gi-Oh. Like something that makes a su successful business can also like teach you how to build a better deck. <laughs> That's actually interesting. Yeah. All right. So, I'm, the first question I got to ask you is, how do you feel Konami's handling the game at the moment? Are you happy with it? Yeah, I mean, I like the game a lot. As long as I, I like shorter ban lists, I like when things change. I like 
I, sw- I, I actually really did like that um, they did the adjusted list because I like it where they're doing like one YCS and then they change something. Because, um, like, I mean, if you let it go too long, then the format just gets solved and like there's no advantage to be had. Like, for instance, last year, it, um, for like when nationals came, the format had basically been the same since like February and it was July. And like when you have a format with the same for five months, then like there's nothing else really to solve. Um, it's all kind of like been done. And, um, so I like that they're doing more frequent changes to just have something that you can solve. So you're basically a puzzle kind of man. If there's if there's no challenge in front of you, it just bores you. Yeah, definitely. Huh. Um, now, I don't know if this is crossing the line, but when the whole Dijin thing came up, did you expect the community to react the way they did? Uh, I don't know. I didn't really care. <laughs> Um, cause I mean, like it was a legal play, so whatever. <laughs> oh, no, no, I, it, it is, it is what it is. I mean, there's no right or wrong. It, it's just, it's interesting to see how the community can react to something that's not so big, but it ends up turning into something so much more. Yeah. So uh, you want to know something funny is like, you know, a lot of people don't know, but I, I never actually did it. Um, like I fully intended to do it and I would have done it, but like there were like four different rounds or something. I think it was where I could have done it, and like it just never came up. Where it was like one guy told me he didn't want to side it out, and then like another round we went to time in game one, and then it was just like something consistently different every single time. Um, so I never actually did it. I just said that I did it to basically take the heat off of Ben. But, Fair enough. I, mean, right. what, I intended to do it. So. All right, so I got a I got a few questions here for you. Uh, Berninski asked, uh, how much money does Hoban spend per month format a year? Uh, and how much does he usually pay for travel expenses? Um, well, I don't really buy many cards. I basically just borrow a lot of cards. Um, I have a lot of really good friends that, you know, uh, they like buy and sell and stuff, but they also want to like keep a personal collection. Um, but they're not as focused on playing, so they don't mind, you know, loaning out cards. Um, so, like, I'm, I, I own some cards. I, mo- I mostly own, like, the older, like, staple-like cards or whatever. And then just, like, whenever new stuff comes out, I usually just try and blotter that. I'm broke. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> so, who are your current sponsored by? ARG. All right, all right. Uh, you get you get to be on the same team as uh, Fraser and whatnot. Yep, they give me a bunch, they give me uh, money for just writing articles. Fair enough. Um, someone asked actually in regards to your articles if you're going to resume your history of competitive play series. Maybe those articles. Like I really enjoy doing those articles. The only problem is that uh, like a normal article might take like an hour and a half or something to write. Those articles took like four or five hours, so they were just very very involved. Um, so there was a lot of research. It was basically like a research paper instead of just me sitting down talking about whatever I wanted to. Fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, which uh, one of your what's what's your format you enjoy playing the most? Um. The next format. The next format. It's all. It's yeah. always that puzzle, right? Yeah, I don't know. Like, I feel like whenever, like, I like playing goats. I like playing baby rulers, but it, it's not the same. Like, those formats are just kind of like solved. Um, I feel like I when even when I play goats, it's like I'm either you know sitting down and playing a format with someone that like I know more about it than they do, or we know the same things, and there's not really a whole lot of like way to go up. And like, yeah, sure, it's fun, but like. I think that learning the next format is always a lot more fun and a lot more challenging because it hasn't been solved yet. All right, someone asked, uh, what would you like to see change on the next ban list? Uh, literally just anything, as long as there is change. Like, I don't, I don't care what the best deck is. I'm not, like, attached to a deck or anything. Um, Except for Ignites. I do like Ignites, yeah. I think they're really good. Uh, well, they're not good. I just want them to be. <laughs> but... Um, but as long as something changes, I don't really care. I guess I'd like to see, like, I don't really know why Nat Beast is still allowed. They should probably be in that card. Um, it's kind of an auto win every time it's flipped. Like, people think setting strike is enough. 
but it's really not because like every time you summon Navius, you make King of the Feral Imps next to it, so that you're starting your next turn. Even if you strike the Navius, they're like just getting a free search off King of the Feral Imps. Plus, they ha had already loaded their extra deck up from the turn before, and that like if you have to flip strike on a Cherry Beast, then like you're just gonna they're just gonna attack you for game that turn. Um, so basically, they're just like no good outs to Navius, and, and I think I should probably hit that one. How do you feel about the uh, recent discussions on Edison format showing back up all of a sudden? Edison format? Uh, see, I wasn't, like, I. that was before I had traveled, so, like, I didn't really get to play very much, um, at least competitively then, and I certainly didn't know what the hell I was talking about then. So I don't really have, like, an informed opinion about how good the format was. I mean, there's a difference between living it and going back and researching it. I'm, um, I'm, I'm sure Goats has taught us that. Yeah, definitely. Like I know that, like three Xerion or whatever is pretty commonly played in today's goats, but like it was like a one of then. Uh, someone wanted to know what what your uh, in your opinion what the top five decks of the format are. Top five decks, um, probably Pendulums, um, Monarchs, Cosmo. I I think that all the um, uh, the Phantom Knight cards are really good cards. Um, I don't know that they're so much a coherent deck yet, but I think they're all really good cards. Um, and Ignites, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I, I don't really think they're very, there's um, really more than three decks ever in a format. Like, even when it seems like they're more than three decks, a lot of the time it's just two decks are filling the same role. Like, for instance... Um, I would consider Necroz format like a two deck format. It'd be like Necroz and like anti Necroz, even though there was maybe have been like, you know, Satel or BA, whatever, all taking the form of the anti Necroz. They were all trying to do the same thing. And I don't really feel like there can ever be more than three decks in a format, or, or like at least not more than three decks trying to do the same thing. And I think that those three decks are pretty much just um, uh, Monarchs, Cosmo, and Pendulums. All right. So a uh, uh, viewer asked, can you suggest ways for a Yu-Gi-Oh player that doesn't play very competitive decks but wants to move on to more advanced decks? Uh, how would you advise them for the transition? Um, probably just like uh, play a lot. <laughs> um, keep up with uh, what the standard deck is and how it changes from event to event. Like, I mean, I think that. Um, like, you know, the Vegas this weekend streamed, I would probably try and watch that if they weren't going. Um, all the circuits are streamed. Uh, and then you just get, like, a better idea of, like, how the best decks are played. And, uh, also, someone asks, how do you find tech cards that give you an edge? Do you have a set pool of go-to tech cards, or do you more so, like, search and read up on older cards to incorporate new cards? Um... Well, there are a couple different ways to do it. Like, uh, first of all, I have this one. Uh, I have this one uh, DN deck. I probably shouldn't say that. I'm banned. But whatever. <laughs> <laughs> like, of all the cards that I think will be good eventually, and um, you know, it's just like cards that I don't think are there yet. But once something happens, like for instance. Um, uh, what's the trap card from Bosch that's like Vanity's Emptiness? Uh, Dragon's Bind? Is that what it's called? Yeah. 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 Like, I don't think that card can be good while, as long as Face Off is in the game. But as soon as, like, Face Off is gone, I think that card could be broken. So, like, that card's on the list. Or, um, it's just a bunch of cards that have, like, random synergy, um, or cool interactions. Like, you know, the On Eyes, uh, Fusion, that card's really cool. But, like, I don't think it's necessarily that good right now. Um, so I'd have a whole list of those. Plus, um, there's this Wikipedia page that, um, will tell you every single kind of a card by like what it does like so let's say you want to um if it activates from your banished pile there's like a category of those cards and you can just click activates from banished and it says every single card in the game that activates from banished and then um so like if you're look, trying to fulfill like a specific interaction then you could just like go find what kind of it is what kind of it is like or you know 
activates from deck or sends from banished to graveyard or something, and then you just go click on that, and you can find the best card um, out of, uh, of all the cards that exist that fill that interaction. That's how I found a lot of the tech cards. I, uh, I need to revisit a, a topic from earlier, but uh, someone asked, uh, how did you get into Yu-Gi-Oh? It was just uh, your locals, right? Well, yeah, like, um, I was probably, like, third grade, I don't know, I was, like, probably nine years old or something, and, like, all our, all my friends were going to Books a Million, and we were playing Pokemon every week, and then one day they were just like, alright, we're on to Yu-Gi-Oh now, and I'm like, cool. <laughs> I just kind of went with it, but it kind of stuck. Did you ever watch the show? The show? Yeah, a little bit. Um, of the original one. So you're a, you're an original guy. Like that that's yeah. actually really good. I haven't I haven't um I haven't watched the show lately. I, I know that like when I started playing like Metal Raiders had just come out, which is the second pack ever. Uh, someone else wanted to know uh what you uh, what what archetype would you uh, want banned from the game to make the game healthier? I thought we were just talking about what archetype do I want to be good. I was about to slam ignites as my answer. Uh, <laughs> nah, uh, what archetype would I want banned? Um, hmm. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, sure he is. Hit beast and barky on all those cards that don't let you play. Uh, um. Hmm. I don't know if I think there's like a particularly bad archetype for the game. I feel like Gishkis are really exploitable. They probably shouldn't be around. <laughs> is there is there any game mechanics or certain types of cards? Um, I, I don't like trap cards. You can ban all the trap cards. <laughs> well, okay. Well, on the same topic here, did did you feel that the the player not getting the six card turn one really makes a difference? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think it made. Um, I definitely think it did make a difference. I think it's starting to make less of a difference um, because like the power curve is like catching up to it. Like it made going second better for a little while, um, but now I think we'll like we're getting good enough cards to where you still just want to go first, and that the extra card is worth it. Uh, worth giving up. Fair enough. Uh, Berninski wants to know if you uh, still play any of the Pokemon games, and are you hyped about the new ones, if so? I don't still play any of the Pokemon games, but I I was all about that Pokemon Silver for a while when I was a kid. I played that game forever. That was my favorite one. Um, what other card games do you keep up with? Um, I don't really keep up with other card games. Um, I... Like like I said, I read Next Level Magic, but I don't even know how to play Magic. Um, I like that because like Magic's like a uh, they're like ten years older or something than Yu-Gi-Oh. So I like that a lot of the theory um, translates to Yu-Gi-Oh. But I think that uh, there's not like a whole lot of new theory coming out anyway. So I, I don't really keep up with it very much, and I, I don't even know how to play. Uh, Savage HR wants to know if uh, your book's going to be available on the uh, European market anytime soon. Yeah, um, it'll be available on all the Amazon uh, Europe markets. <laughs> all right, we got we got a few more questions here, Hoban, and uh, we'll, we'll start to wrap it up here. But uh, someone wants to know what you, what are your feelings about the Ariande uh, deck at the moment? Uh, combo cards are better than traps going second, but are Solemn so strong? Uh, that it's fine to play them. Yeah, I don't know. It, all right, so <laughs> literally this last weekend on my deck list for deck name, I just wrote the concession because it was just like, man, I don't really want to play a bunch of trap cards, but like we just played tested a bunch and we just couldn't find anything better. So ended up playing them. I think Ariana's really good. I don't know. Because um, like Ariana's basically a trap card in your engine. But it also comes with the concession of having to play four actual traps that can only ever be traps but like i mean they're really good too all right i have a funny question which uh i hope you make is there going to be an audiobook i can't read 
<laughs> um, I don't know. No plans for one, but I'm not really opposed to the idea. I just haven't really looked into it. Like, I looked into doing an ebook a lot, but like I said, the royalties on it were just so much worse that it just didn't make sense to do it. Dude, you, um, get, you get Morgan Freeman to read that shit? You, you, you that would be amazing. I'd buy the book. <laughs> yeah, yeah, listen to it. Uh, Ned, Ned here, uh, Glasgow Yugi over here, ask, uh, how far in the future do you look for text, archetypes, single card releases to incorporate into your deck? Uh, do you plan your future decks while you look well ahead in time, or do you prefer to look at the game uh, from the format to format rather than set to set? Uh, I basically look format to format. Like I don't keep up with shit that's not out. Like I don't know what a single OCG card does. If it's not out in America, I have no idea what it does. Um, but I do have like a lot of ideas that I that are out now or have been out now that I like try and hold off on. But nothing that's not out already because I don't know what they do. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, is there any last minute things you would like to say? Um, everybody should check out my book. <laughs> uh, John, anything else you wanna wanna ask? Uh, I think I had one other thing to ask. Let me look here on the questions that I had ready. Um, let's see here. Well, that got answered. That got answered. Ah, okay. Uh, here's a good final note. You are among the most winning players at Konami tournaments and the most winning on the ARG Circuit Series. What are key contributions to that success? Like, what do you feel overall gives you the edge over every other competitor to put you in that kind of realm of talk? Deck building, by far. Like, like I said, I don't think you can... Uh, realistically try and win a tournament by like being better than all of your opponents like you're eventually going to get tired you're eventually going to misplay but like at the end of the day it's really hard to um, outplay someone who has a better deck so I think that the biggest advantage you can have is just by creating a deck that's better than every other deck in the room and then like whenever you get that right it almost certainly turns into doing really well at the tournament alright that's it for me I got one more here for you Hoban uh, uh, Savage also asked uh, ask Elvin how he deals with turn one back row with an established board with no hard spell and trap removal uh, does he play conservatively or does he just play into it and if it stops him he lost anyways essentially does he play not to lose or play to win um, well it depends uh, on like what what else they did like let's say they just have a board but then you know they didn't make like pendulum sorts of wood board or something so they don't have a follow up there you could probably play a little more conservatively because they're probably not going to kill you with just what's on the board but if they had um you know like they went like search skull crow bat search monkey board after making a board and they had traps then like it doesn't matter whether or not they had a trap there because if you don't go all in and then just hope that they don't have it, then like they were just gonna kill you the next turn anyway. So there, you kind of just have to go for it. Um, and if it works, it works. And if it doesn't work, well, then if they had already searched follow up, then you'd probably already lost anyway. Fair enough. Might as well give your chance yourself the chance to maybe win instead of you know definitely not winning. All right. Well, we appreciate having you on, Holman. I linked your book again for the people that are just now joining us to get the chance to check out. Uh, any okay. final shout-outs? Uh, Shout-out to ARG. Uh, hope to see everyone this weekend in Vegas. It's my favorite city. By far. Yeah, we have that play mat of you in Vegas in the house floating around. I, uh, Vegas is an amazing city. I'm looking forward to it on my flights tomorrow. So... Looking forward to going to that. I only booked yesterday. It was sketchy, but... <laughs> All right. Well, fair enough. Uh, thanks for joining us, Pat. It means a lot. Yeah, thank you, guys. All right. All right, guys. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed this. Well, we can... Uh, Are yeah. we going to do a feature here? Let's see. Uh...